All right, church, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in the Lord of Prayer, and then we'll dive into his word today. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you this morning thankful, hearts full of praise and worship to you. We thank you, Lord, for the truth that you have already revealed to us this morning in songs and prayers and liturgy. And we just pray that that would continue now. Our worship would continue now as we hear your truth. Speak to us this morning. Convict hearts of sin. Mend up those who are wounded. Lord, spiritually and physically, Lord, we pray that you would do a miraculous work of grace in the gathered assembly, even here today. We love you, Lord, in Christ's name. Well, today, church, we are looking at arguably one of Jesus' most important and well-known parables in all of Scripture. Some call it the parable of the sower. We call it the parable of the seeds. Some call it the parable of the soil. I think any of those are legitimate. But we do have 20 verses in all to look at today, so we're going to waste no time. Sound all right? Yeah. Yeah. Sound good? Yeah. All right, let's get to it, okay? Here's how we're going to move through the passage today. And we're going to see briefly the, the setting of the parable. Verse 1, Mark 4, verse 1. The setting is in verse 1. We're going to look at the teaching of the parable, verses 2 through 9. We're going to look at the purpose of the parable in verses 10 through 12. And we're going to look at Jesus explaining the parable, verses 13 through 20. So we'll look at the setting, the teaching, the purpose, and then the explanation. And then finally we'll consider how we can apply this parable to our lives. But before we get into it, what exactly do we mean by parable? Okay, from the, from the Greek, parable simply means a symbolic or fictitious narrative. It's a story. Okay? A parable is a story from common life, typically, used to convey a moral lesson. It's poetic, it's, it's proverbial. It, a par- parabolic speech is, is a way of using simple truths of reality to convey a deeper moral meaning. That's what we mean by a parable. Interestingly enough, this is actually not Jesus' first use of a parable in Mark's Gospel. If you look back briefly to Mark chapter 3, Jesus is interacting with the, the Jewish leaders, you'll remember, and, and they were accusing him of being possessed by Satan, Mark 3, 23, And he called them to him and said to them in parables. Is that word there? In parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? He goes on, metaphorically speaking, about divided kingdoms and households and and the strong man being bound and and his house plundered. All of that is parabolic speech. So even in that text, Jesus is using parabolic speech to paint word pictures. He's, He's teaching in those moments. Jesus is very comfortable speaking in parables. We know in our our passage today, actually marks the beginning of a a series of Kingdom of God parables that we're going to see these next couple weeks throughout chapter 4 of Mark's Gospel. Let's look look quickly at the context of our passage, the context before we dive into the actual parable. So looking at verse 1, Mark 4, looking at verse 1. Again, he, Jesus, began to teach beside the sea. A very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. Now, we've actually seen this setting before. Again, remember back to Mark chapter 3. After Jesus healed the man with the withered hand, remember that? Mark 3, verse 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, Galilee, and a great crowd followed him. Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, everywhere. Huge crowd following Jesus. Right? And, and when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. Stand for a moment. Okay? They're, they're swarming Jesus, and he literally gets out on a boat just to be off the coast 
to speak to them from there. He's using the boat as a sort of pulpit to teach his message. And so we're seeing that again here in chapter 4. This is the context of our passage. Now let's get into the content in verse 2, starting in verse 2. Jesus was teaching them many things, parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, I think Jesus wants us to pay attention. Listen, behold, listen up. A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Right, now here you have, uh, just to kind of paint the picture of what we have with this rocky ground, right? You have a thin layer of soil just above the rocky ground, the, the, the rocks, and the seeds are absorbed into that little bit of dirt, about an inch or two, but, but they can't go, the, the, the roots can't go deep because you have a, a, a rock bed there. They, they can't pursue the, the soil any further, and so they, they shoot up quickly, but then they die off. They're scorched by the sun. Verse 7, other seed fell on the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked him, and it yielded no grain. Now, often when we think of the Middle East, we think of Israel specifically, we picture very dry, sandy, desert like conditions, and that's accurate to some extent. But we have to realize that over time, Israel and the Middle East in general has become more dry and desert like these days, more so than it was in Jesus' day, in the Old Testament times. It's generally believed that throughout the Old Testament era, and even into Jesus' day, the land of Israel was much more lush and green than it is now, especially in the north, in the Sea of Galilee. So farming crops and sowing seeds would, would be very common in Palestinian agriculture. Right? We would have they would have been very familiar with this illustration Jesus is, is using to teach his lesson here. In those days, typically a sower would walk through the fields with an apron full of seeds. And he would scatter them with his hand, he or she, as they walk along. And this was done before the field was plowed, before the ground was prepared, not after. And so as the seed was, was tossed here, there, and everywhere, it would land just about anywhere the sower walked, including sometimes the very path that he's walking on, or the shallow, rocky ground, as we saw, or the thorny thistles and weeds, right? Seeds go everywhere. And it wouldn't have been uncommon to see the sorts of things that Jesus is speaking of, right? A couple of birds swoop in and eat a couple of the seeds. When the seeds land on that shally, or shallow, rocky ground, and then they shoot up quick, but then they wither and die. Other seeds land in a patch of weeds and they get kind of just swallowed up by the thorns and thistles. They would have understood this sort of analogy. And so Jesus, in a sense, is, is meeting the people where they are as he teaches them. He's painting a very earthy, common picture with his words. This is common, this is familiar. But what's uncommon about the story is what we're about to see in verse 8. What's uncommon? Is in the next part of this parable, look at verse 8. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30 fold and 60 fold and 100 fold. It's a lot of fold. It's a lot of fold. Of course, the goal of the sower was to scatter seed on as much good soil as possible. But when this happened, typically historians say commonly understood successful harvest would have been six to ten times what was sown. In other words, for every seed, I expect six to ten heads of grain to grow. But this is why I say Jesus' parable quickly becomes uncommon. He's describing a wildly successful increase of 30 times, 60 times, or even 100 times what was sown. Sometimes we struggle with agrarian 
language. It's called it's called dollars. Americans. A dollar too. For every one dollar you invest, every four quarters you find in the premise of the car, I'm gonna give you a hundred dollar bill. Does that sound good? That's an investment. That's an investment, right? That's that's impressive. That's success. And this is saying that this is the sort of super successful harvest the sower is going to experience for the good soil. That's pretty abnormal to say the least. Then it closes his, his teaching in the same way he opened it in verse 3 with, with an emphasis on listening well. Verse 3, Jesus said, listen, behold. Verse 9, he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus wants us to listen. This is a theme we're going to see in the next few passages. Jesus is emphasizing how crucially important it is for his people to listen, to hear, to receive the word. So up to this point, the disciples and the crowds, they, they've heard, but now we're going to see that they haven't truly yet understood. And so they go to Jesus privately. We've seen the teaching of the parable. So now the purpose of the parable. Verse 10. Verse 10. The purpose of the parable. And when he was alone, those around him of the twelve asked him about the parables. So Mark's describing a later point here. A time and future change of scene where the disciples ask Jesus to help them understand what he's saying. Jesus says to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So that, verse 12, they may indeed see, but not perceive. And may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. If that's not a hard word, I don't know what it is. I don't care if you claim Arminianism, Calvinism, you know what those words mean. It's a hard word to receive. Jesus makes it very clear that there are some who have been sovereignly, divinely given the blessing of the secret of the kingdom of God, and there are others who simply have not. There are some who God chooses to reveal certain spiritual realities, and there are others who do not receive such a blessing. So the disciples ask Jesus about the parables, and he gives them a, a peek behind the divine curtain to see and understand God's sovereign purposes in these parables. And he does so by quoting the Old Testament. Very familiar passage from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, and I think a little bit of context from Isaiah will help us understand why Jesus quotes him here. Isaiah chapter 6, remember the prophet saw his vision of the Lord. Right? He sees the, the ancient of days on his throne, and, and he was undone by his sin and shame. God extended mercy to him, the atonement of sin. Isaiah 6. But then we pick up in Isaiah 6, 8. Isaiah 6, 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, so this is Yahweh to the prophet Isaiah, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and their blind and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. As A continues, then I said, How long, O Lord? How long? And he said, Now listen to the listen to the judgment language here of God. And he said, until the cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, 
and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. So this is the context of, of judgment. It's the context of the judgment of God on his people. Because in that day, God was calling the prophet Isaiah to herald God's message to a stubborn, stiff-necked, rebellious people in Judah and Jerusalem of that day. And so this language of deaf ears and blind eyes speaks to the hearts of the rebellious sinners. Isaiah was dealing with them in his day, and so is Jesus in his day. The context fits. Remember what we've seen in Mark so far, leading up to our passage today. Though some of the uh, the disciples and the twelve apostles, some of them have, have actually heard and believed in Christ, and believed his word about the reality of God's kingdom and the identity of Jesus, so many others have outright rejected him. They rejected him, including Jesus' own family. We saw last week. Right? They, they rejected the Lord. Jesus, as well as the, the religious leaders of Jerusalem, we've seen them. Not only did they reject Christ and his message, but they've even recently publicly attributed all of his work to the work of Satan. It's a problem. It's a problem. And so it shouldn't surprise us here to hear some hard words from Jesus. One theologian puts it this way on this passage. He says, the disciples are enabled by God to see in this mission the secret of the kingdom of God, while those whose eyes are blinded and whose ears are dull see nothing but a disturbing and mystery. The same author comments on this, this concept of divine revelation, disclosure. He says, the citation of Isaiah 6, verse 9, does not mean that those outside are denying the possibility of belief, it indicates that they are excluded from the opportunity of being further instructed in the secret of the kingdom so long as unbelief continues. Jesus' presence, therefore, means disclosure and veiling. It releases both grace and judgment. End quote. So Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah here at this point in Mark's Gospel, to help his disciples understand that his prophetic role as the Messiah is important. He is speaking the words of God upon a stubborn and rebellious people. Their hearts were just as darkened and, and wicked as their fathers were in Isaiah's day. And so their judgment is that they're spoken to merely in parables and dark riddles rather than clear truth. But this judgment isn't the same for everyone. This judgment is not the same for all the disciples. Look at the next verse, verse 13. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So in Christ's mercy and grace, he's about to actually extend an explanation to his inner circle, to his disciples. Yes, many have been left in the darkness because of their sin and the hardness of heart. But Jesus lovingly takes his true family aside to walk them through the meaning of the parable. We also have to know Jesus' statement in verse 13 that understanding this parable is actually the, the key to understanding all the parables. That's important. You can see that in the coming weeks. So let's look at Jesus' explanation now. So the purpose of the parables. Let's look now at the explanation, the divine interpretation of the parable. Verse 14. Jesus says, the sower sows the word. So immediately, Jesus begins breaking it down for us. It's a one-to-one -one interpretation. He identifies the sower as one who is faithful to proclaim the word of God. So then the seed is the word. The word is the seed. It's helping us understand here. 
Now, what does Jesus mean by the word? Based on what we've already seen in Mark, the word should be understood as the message, the gospel, or the good news of the kingdom of God. Remember Jesus' fundamental core message in Mark 1, back in verse 15. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. That's the summary of his message. Mark 2, verse 2, and it says, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. Okay, so in the parable, the sower is the gospel proclaimer, the one who scatters the message of the kingdom of God here, there, and everywhere. And then we begin to see the results of that seed sown. In Mark 4, verse 15, Jesus says, And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown to them. These would be people like the Jewish leaders, for example, who have heard Jesus loud and clear, they've heard his message, but they have absolutely no category for Jesus, writing it off immediately as blasphemy and falsehood. In these cases, the word has fallen on their ears and is immediately snatched away by the evil one. And the irony here, the irony is, is actually amazing. The thought that the people who thought they were the furthest from the devil and the closest to God were actually in the exact opposite position they thought they were. They were completely and utterly deceived. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul, right? Who, who would come later as he, he ferociously breathed out threats against the Christians. He's, he's hunting them down left and right. He was, ironically enough, working full time for Satan in his pursuit to honor God, right? It's the exact opposite of what they thought. And so this fruit, or the lack thereof, is the seed sown along the path. So Jesus helps his young disciples see that as he and as they spread the gospel, they should expect that the living and active enemy of God is going to do everything in his power to corrupt and deceive and destroy the effectiveness of God's word. So verse 16. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. Rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation, let's say, bad circumstances, or persecution, let's say, bad people, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. So what does this sort of rocky ground reception mean? Look like well, it looks like First John chapter two. First John chapter two, verse eighteen. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, the antichrist is coming. So now many antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not all of us. So scripture speaks about those who, who at one point seem to have believed the word. They seem to have been transformed and changed by the gospel. They really do. It looks like the real thing. But then we think of texts like Hebrews 6, for example, where, where those who at one time received the word of Christ with joy are actually in time exposed as false converts. Jesus is, is teaching his disciples that in some cases, you may think that the word has truly landed on a person's heart. You might, you might believe that based on their happy, joyful response to the gospel. They're, they're showing up to church, they're coming around, they're faithful, they seem joyful about the truth. Maybe even for a, a significant season, they seem to be engaged with the Lord and with his word. 
But eventually, it's revealed that they never actually possessed saving faith. And you name the reason. You name the reason they fall away. Right? Life gets busy. Circumstances get difficult. It becomes harder and harder to, to consistently live out those biblical principles. And, and it gets more and more tough to just walk in that holiness. And so they endure for a while, but eventually they reveal that they have no root in themselves. They're like those, those, those quick growing weeds that pop up the day after you blow the lawn. There they are. Wow. There they are. And they're, and they're strong and they're healthy. Where did their head go? They're gone, right? They wither out. Jesus is teaching that these are the ones who are sown on the rocky ground. So verse 18. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So here we have more of a, a rich young ruler sort of situation, right? And to, initially, he's, he's, he's on board following Jesus, coming after him. He says, Lord, what, what must I do to gain eternal life? Remember that? And Jesus says, oh, not much. Just give all that you have away. Follow me. Right? And what happens? The man walks away sad because he knows where his heart truly lies. See, the ones sown among the thorns are the ones who hear the word of God, they express an initial interest in the word of God, but they just, they just can't get past that lure and that temptation of worldly pleasures and wealth. Their hearts are, are torn, and ultimately they fall more deeply in love with the things that God has made than the God who made the things. And you have to think about the irony, again, of, of the 12 apostles sitting around hearing Jesus say these words. Little did number 12 realize that he would soon be choked out by the thorns. The thorns of worldly riches, Judas Iscariot, would soon become the living example of one who was taken over by the deceitfulness of riches. Right? Betraying Jesus for a few silver coins. So Jesus is teaching that the word of God will land on some like these as well. Some will be deceived by Satan and reject the gospel outright. Some will accept and believe at first, and then they'll fade away. Some will receive the word, but it will be choked out and destroyed by the overpowering love of worldliness. And so, at this point, overall, the, the the parable seems kind of scary if we're honest with ourselves, right? It seems like the, the relatively weak and discouraging harvest is, is a disappointment. Three out of four types of soil are going to fail. They're not going to produce any harvest. But there's a fourth. There's a fourth type of soil. There is good news to this message. Look at it in verse 20. Verse 20. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. They hear the word, they accept it, and they bear fruit. Thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. So they hear, they actually listen to the word of Christ. They accept, they receive the word of Christ as the truth. And then they obey the word of Christ. They allow that word to take root and change their actual life. Yeah. Now, lest we be discouraged that only one out of the four soils bears any fruit, Jesus explains that the abundant harvest of the good soil will be more than sufficient to compensate for the loss of the bad soil. Right? Remember the 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. That means that the Word of God, though rejected by many, in various ways, will ultimately be successful to fruitfully multiply and fill. What God do? What do? 
There's no good will. Praise God. God has every intention to bring about abnormal success through the seed of his word. So these student disciples have no reason to hang their heads in this parable. Jesus is teaching them that they, they must be that good and fertile soil ready to truly hear and accept and obey the word of Christ. And that's the, that's the end of the instruction. And Mark continues right along in the story. So the question for us this morning is what must we do in response to these things? We have heard Jesus' parable. We have understood his purpose and his explanation. What, what, what must we do with this information? How must we obey? As we start to bring things to a close, I have four closing points. Four closing points in light of the four soils of the parable. Okay, let's start with drawing some application from the path. The path. So number one, for taking notes, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we must protect and proclaim the true word of Christ. <clears throat> as disciples of Jesus Christ, we must protect and proclaim the true word of Christ. Remember what Jesus said about that word so long ago. The path, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes it away, takes it away with some to you. We have to notice here, the problem in this scenario is most definitely not the soul and his aiming abilities. The problem is not the seed. It's not the, the issue. The problem is the soil, right? The problem is the soil. I like this quote from John MacArthur on his text. He says, we, the modern church, we are so bent on the style of the soul and creating some kind of synthetic, acceptable seed that we've mutated the gospel into such a corrupted form that it no longer has power to save because it isn't the true gospel. Saints, our job is not to change the sower. Our job is not to change the seed. The success of our gospel proclamation will not depend on our ability to disguise the true God so that he's more palatable or repackage the message so that it's more palatable and attractive to lost sinners. Church family, our first and primary mission must be to protect and proclaim the true gospel of Christ. The true gospel. The message that there is there is a holy and righteous God in the heavens who made all things. We are his sinful creation who rebelled against him in the garden. We did that. But because of his love and mercy, he spared humanity from ultimate and complete wrath by sending his one and only son into this dark world. By his perfect life and death and resurrection, Christ has accomplished the only means by which any man or woman or child is saved. The only means. Saints, this is the word of Christ that we proclaim. This is why proclaiming truth is number one on our list of four values. But we want to make a big deal of proclaiming truth. It's our job. This is the word of Christ we proclaim. 1 Timothy 3.15 calls the church of Christ a pillar and buttress of the truth, a foundation for the truth. Martin Luther described the church as a mouth house. So he calls the church a mouth house. What he means by that is that our primary function is to be the voice of God's truth to the world. How else are they going to get it? We must, we must never forget that we are weak and brittle vessels of flesh. Yet it's our privilege and responsibility as Christians to carry and herald the true gospel of Christ. But not only that, part of our responsibility in protecting the true word of God is also exposing that which is not the true word of God. 
This is why Paul writes to Titus about the, the calling and the requirements of elders in God's church. Titus 1 verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it as part of the responsibility. So Jesus teaches us in this parable that the word can and will be easily twisted and distorted and ultimately snatched away by the enemy. And so it's our job as the church to both proclaim and protect the true word of Christ. Let's think now about the rocky ground. The rocky ground. So number two, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we must expect tribulation and persecution to arise on account of the word and yet stand firm. And yet stand firm. So we, we expect the tribulation. We're prepared for the persecution, and yet we stand firm on the truth of God's word. Remember what Jesus said about the word sown along the rocky ground. He said, when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. So saints, we need to just go ahead and expect that tribulation. To come on account of the word. Don't miss that one. It's going to come in relationship to the true word of God. Christian, don't be surprised when you start undergoing friction at work for being a believer. Don't think it a strange thing when people start removing themselves from your life because of your new radical conservative ideas from that ancient book you read. Don't be surprised by that. Don't be surprised when the world looks at you funny and starts calling you names and saying you're just one of those backwards, backwards fundamentalists actually believing that, that absolute universal morality exists according to God's standards. Don't be surprised when they accuse you. Friends, persecution and tribulation from the world comes hand in hand with the eternal salvation that comes from heaven. And this is all in accordance with God's good and sovereign plan. So don't be a rocky ground Christian, Christian who holds on until it gets hard and then they fail. Don't be that. Don't be a rocky ground Christian who gets tired of the drama that comes with holding biblical convictions. And maybe they, maybe they don't drop the faith altogether at first, but little by little. Compromise by compromise, they begin to drift further and further from God and His actual truth, becoming more and more embarrassed and ashamed of what the Word says. Don't be that. I pray I'm not speaking of anyone under the sound of my voice this morning, but realistically, I, I may be, and time will tell. So, saints, we have to remember that saving faith is lasting. Faith. Run it back. Saving faith is lasting faith. Eternal life is just that. It's eternal. And if you have it, it's not going away. That's the type of salvation that God gives. It's the permanent time. If I quote Dr. Arcee's quote on this one, he says, No one has ever been saved by a profession of faith. We're only saved by the possession of of true faith in Christ. So don't, don't, don't put all of your trust in the fact that once upon a time you confessed a sin or prayed a prayer or walked in the aisle. Don't put your faith on that. Put all of your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Rest your faith upon Him, the object of your faith, the founder and the perfecter of your faith. Look to Him daily as you endure these trials and tribulations and persecutions so that you can truly stand firm until the end. Let's look at the third sword, the thorns, the thorny room. Number three, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we must guard against worldly, thorny, word-choking distractions. We must guard against worldly, thorny, 
word choking distractions. Remember what Jesus said about the thorny soil. Verse 19, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So Christian, what is the most important thing in your life today? What is the number one reason you wake up every day and do what you do? What is the ultimate source of your strength and motivation? If the answer to any of these questions is anything or anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to repent. I don't care how much we love our spouses and our families. I don't care how much we we have passion for our jobs and our careers, our gifts, even if it's ministry. I don't care how much we love our cars and our homes or any other good gift God has given us. If it's all not secondary to God himself, it needs to be put down as an iron. Church, even with the very best intentions, we have to guard ourselves and each other from the thorny, word-choking distractions of this life. So obviously, we need to put off that with the simple. Right? If, if, if it's unacceptable to God, it needs to be put down. If, if you're addicted to alcohol, repent and turn to Christ. If you're addicted, if you're looking at pornography, you need to repent and, and turn to Christ. If you're caught up in any sin whatsoever, you're addicted to gossip, I don't care what it is, Repent and turn to Christ. But we need to also guard against making idols out of the good things that God gives us. Right? May we never be like that young rich ruler who would walk away from the author of life to go find some satisfaction in worldly possession. What? May we never be like the son of perdition Judas who sold his soul and betrayed Christ for a a few sparkling things. And maybe it's unthinkable for us to, to, to imagine selling Jesus out that way, right? But think about this. Are we willing to are we willing to uproot our families from a healthy local church so that we can make a little more money elsewhere? Are we willing to, to put a hush on our biblical convictions here or there in order to get that promotion? That raise? Are we willing to bend the truth here or there just, just slightly for some financial gain? I'm not saying that taking a new job or working for a promotion is bad by any means. Don't get me wrong. But if you can do all of those things without a single consideration to the word of Christ, how are we any different than the thorny soil we've seen this morning? My point is that. As much as possible, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we have to guard ourselves and each other from those word-choking distractions and allurements of the world. I might again say, the pretty, pretty negative applications from this text, but remember, there is a fourth type of soul, right? There is a fourth type of soul. So one fourth and final point from the good soil. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we must hear the word. We must accept the word and obey the word. We're going to bundle that all into one statement. We need to bear fruit. We need to bear fruit. Remember what Jesus said. That those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Church, let us never devolve into what James calls those, those hearers of the word who never do anything. Right? What good is it to hear if we never obey? Right? What good is it to listen to sermon after sermon if we never change? We look the same in our sanctification for years. What are we actually doing? If you remember Brother Emmett's sermon, not long ago, the, the, the man or woman who's, who's simply Keeping up judgment against himself is the one who hears and hears and hears and never does. Church may it never be. May we be the sort of people who truly hear and obey the word of God day after day throughout our lives. James 1.21 
Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word. You think James was taught by Jesus? I do. Receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So be blessed, church. Be blessed in your doing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Fill your mind and your heart with God's word daily. And then let that word translate into true, actual, lasting fruit. Christian, don't just hear about the confession of sins and repentance. Go do it. Bear fruit in that. Make the process of dragging your sins out into the light before God and your loved ones a regular part of your life. Don't just listen to sermons and watch videos about evangelism and apologetics. Go do it. Bear fruit. Obey the word of Christ to you and live a life of full-time evangelism and gospel proclamation. Let your words and deeds be a constant stream of the gospel to everyone you interact with. Husbands and fathers, don't just read about washing your bride in the water of the word. Don't just listen to sermons about raising your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Go and bear fruit in that. Fill your actual house up with the Word of God. Read the Bible as a family. Let the Word of God loose in your home. Whether it's the music you play or the signs on the walls or the conversation around the dinner table. Mark your home as kingdom territory ruled by Jesus Christ. Wives and mothers, don't, don't, don't just read about respecting and submitting to your husband. Don't just read books about the Proverbs 31 woman. Go and do. Go and do. Strengthen your arms like she did. Rejoice in God's love for you and build up your household with everything you've got. Bless your family. Love and respect your husband. And maybe one of my favorite parts of Proverbs 31. Laugh at the threats of the future. That's awesome. What a confidence and a faith in God that she can do that. Because of her firm faith in the Lord. Go and be children. I'm getting off easy. Kids. Come back in. Almost done. Come back in. Don't just let the word of Christ go in one ear and out the other on Sunday. Honoring and obeying your parents. Go and do. Bear fruit, kids. Let Jesus' commands to you actually change the way you live in your family's home. Cleaning your room in a respectful attitude. Let that be a reflection of King Jesus' actual rule in your life. And church, as we daily pursue this sort of fruitful hearing and accepting and obeying, we have every reason to anticipate a successful harvest with every reason to wait for it. And we may not see all the fruit in our own lifetime, right? But we are striving for bigger goals than our own lifetime, right? We're aiming for multi-generational faithfulness and fruit bearing. I was thinking about this this morning. If you and your spouse commit to living a fruitful life of hearing and obeying Jesus, and let's say you have three children, who grow up to do the same. And maybe you have three children who grow up to do the same, and so on, for four to five generations. Within about a century, you've produced somewhere in the ballpark of 250 Christian adults who are joyfully, fruitfully obedient forces for Jesus in the world. But that's multi-generational thinking. And that's, that's on the conservative end. Not to mention all the people those those adults will reach personally for Christ, right? I say that's a successful harvest. 
Close your ears. My prayer today is that each one of us would be that good and fertile, receptive soil Christ wants us to be. May we protect and proclaim the true word of God. May we expect tribulation and persecution on account of the word and yet faithfully stand firm. May we guard against worldly, thorny, word-choking distractions. And ultimately, may we hear and accept and obey the word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have preserved the truth for us. And you haven't just fossilized your scriptures so that we can look at it and go away no different. But your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword to help us to unleash it in our own lives, personally, in our families, in this church, and in our community. I pray that we would be a people who hear and accept and obey the word of Christ for your glory and for our good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.